Okay, and so now we're on to chapter four, our eukaryotic microorganisms or the eukaryotic microbes. And eukaryotic microbes are algae, only one of which is pathogenic to humans, and that's Prototheca. Uh, fungus, which include yeast. Helminths, which are the worms, lots of different types of worms, and protozoa. So if you remember, Helminths and protozoa don't have cell walls, right? Don't forget that, no cell walls. <clears throat> so <clears throat> here we go. Um, if I can get it to scale. All right, algae are photosynthetic. Um, they can come in lots of different colors because they have lots of different uh, photosynthetic pigments. All algal cells contain plastids and almost all of them have cell walls. Most of their cell walls are have cellulose. There are some that are like crystal clear and they have um, something called silica as their cell wall, which makes them clear like glass, which is what, sorry, sorry about that, phone serving, which is what glass is made out of, okay. Um, dinoflagellates are a type of algal cell that actually can have flagella and can be modal in, in waterways. Um, but algae are extremely important to a lot of different things. They can be sources of fuel, um, foods, we use them to, we get iodine from them, fertilizers, emulsifiers, um, a lot of the stabilizers and jelly agents that we use in food production come from algae and the gelling agent that we use for our culture media actually came from a red marine algae. Um, so agarose comes from red marine algae. Okay. Medical significance, again, one genus of algae, Prototheca, is very, very rare cause of human infections. Okay, um, there is something called Fisteria that if you remember, uh, if you were here on the Eastern Shore about ooh, eight to ten years ago, um, we had a huge outbreak of Fisteria and all the blood, all the fish were coming up with bloody legions, the, um, because the watermen were handling the, the fish, um, they had lesions on their hands, but there was a lot of fish kills due to overgrowth of this algae, which is actually like a little kind of weird algae. <laughs> it's, if you saw pictures of it, you'd understand what I'm talking about. Um, but algae can, can actually secrete toxins and when you have dinoflagellates that overgrow their area when there's ever, whenever there's an algal bloom or too much algae comes it's always bad news for the marine life just so you know um but a red tide can actually um cause paralytic shellfish poisoning in people who eat the shellfish that have the red dinoflagellates in them. Um, so if your shrimp are pink before you cook them, don't eat them. Okay. <laughs> so if the meat is, it doesn't look like that nice gray white color and it has a pinkish tint to it, don't eat it. Okay. Um, because you may end up being paralyzed and that would be bad. Um, and there's this um, wonderful stuff, Ciguatera, that actually affects freshwater species, and the toxin that is there will can do nothing but hurt you. We don't have an antitoxin, and cooking does not do anything to it. So um, here's an algal bloom. This is a red tide from overhead. You don't see it along the shoreline. 
um, so much, but if you look out further, you'll see the red tide and the shellfish and the shrimp and stuff. They they end up with the red marine red marine algae in as super concentrated in their bodies and their flesh. And then when we eat it, then we can actually get shelf par paralytic shellfish poisoning. These are the ulcerations on humans and on the marine life that are caused by Fisteria, this lovely little algal creature. Okay, um, fungi. Fungi consist of molds and yeast. Okay, yeast are single cells and they have beta glycan in their cell wall as well as the chitin. Um, they can produce something called pseudohyphae, which yeast are typically oval or round looking cells, and then they may produce these little pseudohyphal extensions, which are not truly hyphae, um, which are not truly cellular, okay? Um, and when they reproduce, they reproduce by budding. So if you see this, there's a bigger cell here, and then there's a littler one coming off of it. They will eventually separate, and then they will become two separate cells. And there's another budding one, and there's another budding cell. So you'll you'll see lots of budding. And actually, us seeing budding helps us to identify these cells as yeast instead of red cells when we're looking in like urines and things like that. Um, molds, molds are multicellular and they have cell walls composed of chitin and <clears throat> there are, this is where we need to start talking about hyphae. Hang on a second, let me pull this down just a hair here. Um, hyphae are extensions. They're like cells. They're the cells of the mold. So most of the molds that we see are multicellular and they're very large, right? But what we have to look at is the actual individual cells and their arrangements and how they're they're made. Um, otherwise we can't identify the mold. So um, molds have hyphae and when the little hyphal extensions um, become that mat that's growing on the on the stuff that's growing on your strawberry, on your orange, on your bread, on the auger plate. Um, this group of hyphae all together that makes it macroscopic is called mycelium. Okay, so a mold colony is made up of, is, is called mycelium, which is made up of hyphae. Now there's aerial hyphae, which are at, above the surface of the medium, and there's vegetative hyphae, which take in nutrients from below the surface. Okay, so people who just rip the, the little moldy piece off the top of the bread and then eat it, they're still getting mold. Okay, is the mold going to hurt them? Probably not. Okay, so, you know, people have been doing that for years or cutting the mold off at the edge of the cheese and they continue to eat it. Same thing. All right, so morphology of fungus. Well, <clears throat> most fungal colonies, they have loose associations, they grow in colonies, um, yeast, are like bacteria and they grow clumped together on, in a colony, um, but they're very um, tightly organized. They they look like just a big pile on there. Um, the the fungus have that real velvety, hairy, weird kind of soft looking texture to it, right? Um, so if we go back one. See, they look like little round dots on there, where these are not little round dots. They're big little mats of stringy stuff, right? Makes sense, right? Powdery, soft looking, whatever. Um, yeast, as I, as I said before, typically unicellular, and then they bud. Okay, and when the buds go off, 
um, then they become more than one. Sometimes they form, they join together to form a chain and they become, they have something called pseudohyphae. They are not, pseudohyphae are not technically yeast shape. Okay, just so you know. Um, there are some fungus slash yeast that can exhibit different characteristics ba based on what temperature they're growing at. Okay. Um, in the body, a dimorphic fungus will grow as a yeast and it'll grow at your you know your 37 degrees body temperature it'll it'll present as a yeast and it'll grow yeast colonies and when we get a clinical specimen from the from the person from the patient that's what we see on the slide is we'll see a yeast but if we grow it at room temperature where molds grow it'll grow up as a mold okay and it'll produce mold colonies. So there have been times when you see something come from a patient and they have a regular sputum culture um, and we do the sputum culture and then they do have a fungal culture and then the fungal culture ends up being a mold and the sputum culture ended up being a yeast and then you're put two and two together and you're like holy cow that must have been a dimorphic species the bad thing is that dimorphic species tend to kill people. So if you don't catch that, you might be doing someone a little bit of a disservice. So <laughs> um, dimorphic yeast or dimorphic fungi um, can either look like a yeast or a mold depending on what temperature they grow at. Protozoa, the majority of protozoa that we have in the world are harmless critters. They're little happy things that float around in water or in wet soil or on plants and animals. You have, you probably have protozoa living in your gut. I know there are protozoa living in the in the guts of ants and insects and and other mammals. So I'm sure I have protozoa living inside of me. Um, it's the ones that are pathogenic that can cause problems. Okay. So most of them um, are single cells and they have all of those um, major eukaryotic organelles, but they don't have chloroplasts and they don't have cell walls, right? Um, because I don't know of any protozoa that is photosynthetic. There's a whole lot of information in your book about all of these different types of microbes. Okay. I'm giving you in the PowerPoint the majority of what you need to know. Okay. So don't get too involved in having to know everything about chapter four and all those crazy things like what's the difference between an asexual spore and a sexual spore and don't, don't go there okay um life cycles of the protozoa we typically have two stages of the life cycle that we really worry about and that's the trophozoite stage which is the active feeding reproducing stage okay um and they have to they they need a lot of nutrients to be able to be active um, then there is the cyst stage, and the cyst stage is the dormant resting stage, um, and typically um, they enter the resting stage when the environment or the nutrients aren't quite right, and so then they can survive through that period of time when things aren't doing so hot, and then when things become good again, then they, they can turn active again and become a trophozoid again. Um, it's kind of like that endospore thing, only the endospore creates a new cell. Um, the cyst just does a transformation. And 
Some protozoa don't actually produce cysts, but most of them do. Most of them have that two-stage life cycle. Um, Trichomonas vaginalis doesn't form cysts. It's uh, a very common protozoal pathogen that is sexually transmitted. Entamoeba okay. histolytica and Giardia lamblia both form cysts, and the cysts typically get into can food and water sources um, and contaminate the food or water source, and then people end up getting diarrhea. So reproduction for protozoa can be asexual, meaning that they do a, a split. Okay, the cell replicates and splits. Um, or it can be sexual in that some of them can actually get together. The two cells come together. They exchange some um, micronuclei, which are kind of like the plasmids, only small pieces of DNA that are outside of the nucleus. And then that helps to um, add to the genetic diversity of the microbes. Do yourself a favor and become a little familiar with some of these names. Because if you don't look at who they are, what they cause, you may miss some of the questions on the test. Okay, so it's not a lot of information, but it is it, it is important to understand who these people are, or at least bookmark this page on your PowerPoint so that you can reference it. Hint, hint, when you're taking your exam. <laughs> Um, helminths include flatworms and roundworms, and a lot of them are large enough to see with the naked eye as adults, but not so much when you see the eggs um, or even some of the larvae. So some of these things, we have to, we have to look at them microscopically to be able to identify them um, and diagnose the infection. So th again, that is why helminths belong in microbiology, even though they can be big. Flatworms, really skinny, okay, flat. Um, they're most commonly um, the most common things that people think of are tapeworms, and they have these segmented bodies. So the little proglottids, actually, the further away from the head that they get, the more mature they get, and the more fertile eggs they have in them, and then the eggs can then be dispersed throughout the environment and can grow to be more flatworms. It's fantastic stuff. Um, the roundworms, oh, sorry, the trematodes are flukes. You guys won't hear much about flukes. Um, we have to learn about the blood flukes and liver flukes and lung flukes and bladder flukes in um, clinical microbiology to be able to identify them on a patient. But you guys just hear about parasitology. <laughs> um, but roundworms... Um, are also called nematodes and they are their bodies are actually round okay <clears throat> so they are multicellular organisms they have different organ systems they have brains they have hearts they have reproductive systems they've got gi tracts and and all that stuff so these are a t two different well, two of the same species, that's Ascaris lubricoides, which is the most common roundworm that there is worldwide. Um, and it, well, it's the largest roundworm that we have worldwide. Um, it's pretty common for infections. Um, we don't see it much here in the U.S. unless people have been traveling elsewhere um, because... 
we try to do things pretty well here. But one's a male and one's a female. Pretty cool, huh? Um, so, <clears throat> this, not so much. I don't need you guys to pay too much attention to this. Um, but the, the protozoa, I, I remember there being a question somewhere about who causes malaria, what's a brain-eating protozoa, some, some, there's stuff in there. So just pay attention to where you can find it in your textbooks. Okay. The pinworm. Pinworm is a very, 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 very common infection that happens. It is a roundworm. It is called the seat worm or pinworm. Um, its technical name is Enterobius vermicularis. Um, the eggs look like little flattened footballs. And the adult gets to be at about half of an inch long. And they're white. And kids are common, common, common people who get these infections. And because kids put their mouths, put their hands on everything and stick their hands in their mouths and, and do crazy stuff and don't wash their hands as much as they should, they get this stuff a lot. And they pass them on over and over and over again. So uh, it'll cause irritable sleeping. They won't be able to sleep very well. Their butt itches. It may cause some crankiness from not being able to sleep or, but it's not... It's not a horrible infection. People can live without treating it. Um, it'll self-resolve a lot of times, but also is over-the-counter medications that you can get to fix it. So it's very easily gotten rid of. Uh, there are about 50 species of helminths that cause disease in the world. They're all over the place. A lot of them you can find in higher... Um, higher abundance and activity in the tropical regions of the world but there are a lot of people who still die from helminth infections so it's really important that you understand that this just because it's not necessarily you know um, one of those things that we have to worry about too much here in the US it still happens People still get these things. People travel all over the world and come home. And guess what? Um, we're thinking there's at least 50 million helminth infections in North America every year. 